Well, good morning. As we continue in our study in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, what Dan just read for us is a wonderful passage. This really uh, signals to us that there are two commandments that we must pay attention to. Uh, Jesus was approached and he said, this is the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second, to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said this, all the prophets and the law hang on these two. And if you look back at the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, you find that the first four are in reference to our relationship with God, loving God. And the last six are in reference to our relationship with man. And so today, Matthew 18, we dig a little deeper. Jesus takes us on a journey to see and really continue what we began to see last week as we looked at the first part of Matthew 18. Last week, we said that there are three aspects to kingdom life. We are called by Christ, who is the king, to live in his kingdom. When you're saved, you are part of the kingdom of God. And to be in the kingdom of God is a wonderful blessing. If you want to read about it and know some of the benefits of the kingdom, then you'll want to study Ephesians chapter 1 especially. And you'll see that we are heirs, joint heirs with Christ, and that, that he is seated in a high place and we are also seated with him. And the scripture is just beautiful. It describes our identity in Christ as we live out the faith in this life. And so kingdom life in Christ is not just when you get to heaven. It's also while we're here on this earth. And so last week we covered the first of the three aspects of kingdom life, the way we should be living on this earth as Christians. And in this day and age that we live in, it's difficult. There are many things happening around us that we can't explain, that we don't understand. And we wonder whether or not the Lord is really at work. Believe me, he is. He's a sovereign God. All things fit beautifully in his plan. Even though we see chaos and confusion, God is a God of peace, and he sees everything perfectly. There is no confusion. And he has a plan. We have to hope and trust in the Lord. You've got to trust him for that, church, in this day that we live. And, uh, and so, so we, we see that the first that we talked about last week was humility, that's the first aspect of kingdom life. Verse 4, whoever humbles himself like this little child that came before Jesus is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The reason he shared that was because the disciples start the chapter asking which one of, they were questioning and arguing which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom. And of course the answer is uh, Jesus said, well, none of you unless you become like this little child, unless humility is in your heart. So here's the point. We have to walk in humility on earth as Christians, and when we go to heaven, we'll walk in humility. You're going to do it there, so you might as well learn how to do it here. Amen? All right. Humility was the first aspect. We should be like a child in our simplicity and our purity of heart. Jesus gave a stern warning after that. He talked about what would happen to a person who would lead someone away from a simple and pure devotion to Christ. And he said, it would be better if you had a millstone tied around your neck and you were thrown into the depths of the sea than to keep a little one. And remember, this whole chapter, he uses the analogy of a child. But listen, he's talking about you and I, we are God's children, our Heavenly Father, amen? If anyone leads another person away from Christ, it would be better for them to go and drown themselves. Now, we're not to take that literally today. It's figurative. It's what's going to happen in the end, that if we lead someone from Christ, if we are pushing them in another direction, the Lord says, I will ultimately reject you from heaven. You will not go to heaven. It's a terrible thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a, a condemnation, a judgment upon those who do not believe and who lead others astray. So we come to verse 12, and it says in verse 12, what to do, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one 
that went astray. So really what Jesus is saying here, he really wants to know just how, he wants us to know just how precious we are to him. And that's why those who would harm his children are going to be treated so harshly. He tells this story and he says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds that lost sheep, Truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Don't lead them astray, and it is not God's will that anybody would die a lost sinner. He does not want anyone to perish and go to hell. That's the heart of the Father. It is not his heart for people to go to hell. He doesn't take joy in seeing people die and go to hell. He would like for everyone to receive him through his son, Jesus Christ. So last week we observed three things about God's love from the analogy that Jesus gave. First, we learned that God's love is unconditional. We get that right here in this text that we just read. Even though this sheep strayed from the flock, the shepherd doesn't treat the sheep any different than the rest of the flock. Do you notice that? There's no negative action. There's no, uh, on the part of the shepherd, no tongue lashing, no penalty to be paid by the sheep. His penalty, the sheep's penalty is the fact that he's alone. He has drifted away from the father. He's drifted away from the shepherd. That's the penalty. But the father's heart of love is still very much intact. The fact is that when someone drifts, when someone's lost, they are without God's protection and safety. Now, there is a common grace granted to all men. Even sinners have the ability to live life, to breathe air, to get married, to have children. Those are common graces that God provides everyone on the earth. But we're talking about a saving grace when you're apart from God the Father, when you're not saved, now you do not have that protection. You do not have that intimacy of relationship that the Father desires with you. So what does the shepherd do when a sheep is lost? He goes after it. He leaves the, the, the saved ones in the fold, and then he goes after the one that is separated, that's lonely, that's without protection, the one that has a broken relationship with him. He does not change his love towards them. He goes after them. And throughout the entire story, the shepherd's love is constant. It's unchanging, regardless of the behavior of the sheep. I want you to hear that this morning. Regardless of the behavior of the sheep, in this story, Jesus said the father goes after the lost sheep. His love for that lost sheep does not change based on the behavior. Some of us have been taught some very poor theology that somehow we have to measure up to earn God's love, that we have to do something for God to truly love us. That I look at this person over here and they've got it all together, no wonder God loves them and blesses them so much. The Father's love is the same for everyone. He keeps those who are righteous safe and he goes after the one that's unrighteous because they're unsafe. He doesn't beat the sheep up. He doesn't verbally abuse them. This is a very important point for us to see. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not lead the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the, over the 99 that never went astray. In Psalm 136, verse 1, it says, Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Say that with me. Give thanks to the Lord. And here's why. For he is good. And here it is. For his steadfast love endures forever. That's verse 1. Verse 2 says, Give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love 
endures forever. Verse 3 says, Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Are you getting the focus? Are you seeing what God is trying to convey to you this morning? His love is steadfast. Whenever in Hebrew language you see repetition, that is emphasis. That is the way they exclaim something very loudly. That's the bold print. That's the highlight. What is the highlight? Give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because his love, his steadfast love endures forever. God's love never changes. That ought to make you want to just give a shout to God this morning. I get excited when I think about God's love for me. The Bible's trying to tell us something about our Heavenly Father. There is none like Him. His steadfast love endures forever. Therefore, give thanks. Be glad this morning. God's love for you never changes. God is good. So if there's no change in God's love when I stray, then why not stray? Why not? Because there are problems out there when you stray. There are wolves out there. There are poisonous weeds that a sheep could eat and not know the difference. There are dangerous cliffs in places that will find you, look for you and find you. Jesus made it clear that Satan, he desires to lie to you, to kill you, to destroy you eternally. That's his heart's desire. If there's no change in God, the reason I don't stray is because I want to be in his righteousness. I want to be in his love. I want to be in his relationship. I want to be in relationship with others who love God. If I stray, I lose all that. I miss it. It's not happening. I'm alone in the world. It's safest to stay close to the shepherd. And then here's a second thing about the, the love of the Father that we find in that little story that Jesus told. His love is personal. Not only does he love us, love all of us with a steadfast love, he also loves each of us as if we were the only one to love. See, our tendency is to think that others are more deserving of God's love than I am. Well, let me help you with that. If you think somebody else is more worthy of God's love than you, can I help you with that this morning? No one is worthy of God's love. No one. None are righteous. No, not one. We've all sinned and fallen to the fallen from the glory of God, right? See, the reason that he loves us isn't because we've earned it. It's because we need it. Every human being needs God's love. We're all sinners. So when the Father loves us, his love is unconditional, and he loves us personally. He sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. And if you were the only sinner in a world filled with perfect people, he would still send his son to die on the cross for you. That's an impossibility, by the way, because there are no perfect people. We're all imperfect, amen? How many would you say that you live with somebody in a home that's an imperfect? No, really, raise a hand. <laughs> what you would find if we all were truthful and honest about that is the husband would raise his hand and then the wife would also raise her hand. Nobody's perfect. But this is how the Lord sees us. He sees us as an individual, as a, as a being created in the image of God of great value and worth. I, I want this passage that I'm going to read to you, I want it to just pour over you this morning. Our attempt at Bureau Bible Fellowship is to, to lead you to, to, to a devotion that is simple and pure. So let this scripture just minister to you this morning. Psalm 139 Verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. I want you to notice the psalmist is think, thinking of himself here, his relationship to God the Father. 
You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. There is no way that you've ever taken that God's not aware of. And his love is still steadfast towards you. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. I believe that's true. And if it's true, why doesn't God keep me from letting things come out of my mouth that I wish didn't come out, you know? Give me a little fort. You know, do something. Make my nose tickle or make my ear twitch. I don't know. Do something before it comes out. You hem me in behind and before and lay your head upon me, your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. Do you think that's personal? I'm asking. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. You did not become a living created being of God after the heart started beating. God says he was knitting you together when your parts didn't even make sense. You were an unformed substance. The psalmist recognizes God's work in that. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of, this, of the earth. I just want to go back again, and I want to say it read it one more time. I want you to get this. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Before that, it says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Not just the final product, a whole fetus in the womb, but the work of creating a fetus. As I'm being made, it's fearful. It's wonderful. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. You think God knows you? You think he's sovereign? How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count your thoughts toward me, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. God's love is unconditional. God's love is personal. And thirdly, God's love is filled with emotion when he thinks about you. <laughs> this just When you think about a, a transcendent God, a God who is other than us, we really need this verse. We need the reminder that when God thinks about you, it makes him emotional. When the shepherd finds the wandering sheep, what does he do? Does he rebuke it? Does he lecture it? Does he shake it? No, the word says he rejoices over it. Wait a minute, the sheep ran away. The sheep strayed. What do you mean he rejoices? His love is steadfast. 
when we stray from God and he comes after us to save us, what follows is not an emotional outburst of anger toward us, but the opposite. Our Heavenly Father lets out an emotional display of joy. He gathers us into his arms and rejoices over us because he loves us so deeply. We were lost and now we're found. Luke's gospel gives an insight on that passage that we just read in in Matthew's gospel. Let me share it with you because in Luke's gospel, it records Jesus using the same analogy of the lost sheep as he answered the scribes and Pharisees who questioned why he was eating with tax collectors and sinners. And so I could read the whole thing, but it's literally word for word. And then it comes down after. He says, he says and when he comes, he, call, he comes home, he calls together his friends after finding the sheep and his neighbors. And he says to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And then he says this verse, just so I tell you, Jesus said, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Matthew tells us that our Father rejoices over us when we're found. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is is recorded as saying that heaven rejoices over us when we're saved. Did you know that when you got saved? Did you know that God the Father broke out emotionally with joy over you? Did you know that heaven let out a shout of joy over you? Not only is God rejoicing, but all of heaven joins in, the the heavenly host. Now again, this analogy that Jesus gave us here is the answer to the original question that the disciples were asking about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus said, well, check out this little child. That's the key, see. You enter into heaven, you'll be elevated within the kingdom. As you continue to the first aspect of kingdom life, looking at a child, as you humble yourself. And you don't have to wait to get to heaven to humble yourself. Here on this lo- in this world, we can, as God's ch- children, we can humble ourselves. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, the Scripture says. Humble yourself, and in due season, he will lift you up. You don't want God to humble you in this life. Amen? <laughs> He's telling you, you, why don't you go ahead and just do it? You go ahead and just do it. That's the key. Now, humility confuses a lot of us because we think it means thinking less of ourselves. That's what humility is. It's me thinking less of myself. Humility isn't a matter of thinking less of yourself. It's a matter of not thinking about yourself. Big difference. Have you ever compared yourself to someone else who's better at something than you are? I can't sing like them. I, can't, I wish I could play an instrument like them. You know, that guy's so mechanical. He can fix anything. I'm nothing like that. I can't do anything. And you think you're being humble because it's not about me. You know, I'm just, I, I'm nothing like them. I'm just nothing, you know. And that's not humility. You're, you're, you're degrading yourself. But let me tell you what, what's really behind it. It's pride. Because what did you say in all four of those statements? I, 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 I. You still made it all about you. That's not humility. Humility is when you stop comparing yourself to others. It's when you stop thinking about yourself. Remember when the Lord called Moses and he said, no one will listen to me. Moses said, no one's going to listen because I stutter. Uh, And what did God say back? Who made your mouth? I think I made your mouth. I will be with you. So quit stuttering over the fact that you can't go and represent me. You can do whatever I call you to do. Stop making it about you, Moses. Just be an obedient servant. Make it about me. Amen? Now Jesus connects humility to honesty. Now we go to the second. You see, true humility sees God's work in us not our work without God. And now Jesus connects humility to honesty. That's the second aspect of kingdom life. 
Okay, verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault because between you and him alone, that's where it should happen. Church, listen to me. This is the Bible. This is God's standard. This is the principle. This is the guideline that God gives and how we relate to one another in the church, okay? This is the way Jesus wants it to happen. Why? Why is he saying this right now? Because he's saying we should have the heart of a child. We should be humble, but we should also be honest, Children are honest. And this is how honest Christians, honest, healthy Christians conduct their business with one another. I want everybody to do this so you know what you're saying. Yes, I, I hear you, preacher. Okay, so here we go. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That is a mouthful. Because our tendency is when somebody offends us, we go and tell anybody else other than them. There ought to be an amen in here somewhere. Is that not the truth? It's way too easy for the flesh to rise up. And we even cloak it. So we get on the phone. We call up Sister Susan. Susan, um, I've got a prayer request I need to share with you. Really? What's it about? Uh, well, it, it's about Sister Jones. And man, they unleash. It's like backing a big garbage truck up to that lady's ear on the other end of the phone. Beep, 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 beep. And then dumping garbage in her ear. Or somebody will say, have you, ever, have you heard about such and such what happened? Oh, no, what happened? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> we are so far from, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Alone. Don't seek others to share the story of how that brother or sister offended you so that you can get sympathy from them. That is not the behavior of a kingdom life person. We don't seek sympathy from others because truly that's not going to bring sympathy. You're just making it worse. You're triangulating. What we want to do is seek restoration with the person who offended us. But if he does not listen, I mean, he, Jesus covers the bases here for us. If they don't listen, when, they, when you come to them and say, hey, brother, you offended me on this matter. And I, what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. He's not listening. Take one or two others along with you. That every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I remember confronting someone lovingly about a, something they had said about me that was untrue. And I had them alone in a room and I said, hey, I just want to bring this to you. This is what I was told that you said about me and that really hurt deeply and it hurt my wife deeply when you said it oh I, I didn't say that I don't know what you're talking about well would you like me to bring the person who was in the room when you said it they're glad to meet with us and then the person oh maybe I did say it that's what Jesus is saying needs to happen. Again, you're not just finding anybody that you can bring in. You're not finding your best friend. You're not finding the, the two-ton communications person. When you've got a 10-ton bridge, you don't need to give information to a two-tonner or to you know, somebody who's so, who can't handle it. You want to find somebody who can manage, and you say, would you go with me? You, you know this person. You know what happened. You were there. Come with me. And if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. Let the church know what's going on. Why is Jesus saying this? Why would he go to that point? Because he's trying to protect those who have a simple, pure, true devotion to Christ. He treats us like children, and he doesn't want anything or anyone to take us away from the Heavenly Father. And so here he is, he's saying, go to the extent of bringing them before the church if necessary. Do it. Let him be to you. Look at this. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. 
So the second aspect of kingdom life is honesty. We know that God loves us unconditionally. How do we love each other in the kingdom? How do we do it? With honesty. If I say I love you, but don't talk honestly with you about an offense that you've committed against me because I'm afraid you won't like me afterwards, then my love's not real for you. Real people get honest with each other. Real people love enough to share the truth. Real people speak in love when they share the truth. That's like a doctor who sees a mass in your body but doesn't want to tell you because he doesn't want to upset you with the news that you need surgery. Oh, I wouldn't want to hurt their feelings with that. They think they're doing well. Yeah, I saw that lump. I felt it. Or I saw the mass on the x-ray. But they don't want to hear that, so let's not mess with it. That's hypocrisy. Love without truth is hypocrisy. But truth without love is brutality. We can also be on the side of truth. We just want to be truth tellers about everything. And we're sharing truth with people, but there's no love in, in our sharing. I've done that. It's, it's terrible to hurt people that way. That we would somehow just speak the truth to them, but never really come in a spirit of love, come with grace and tenderness as we share. See, the goal of, of church discipline, that's what we're dealing with here. The goal of reconciling or, or, or coming together and and confronting our issues is for the purpose of restoration. The whole purpose is restoration, that we would be reconciled. Church discipline doesn't take place because we want to offend somebody, condemn them, and send them out for the trash heap. No, no. The whole process of being truthful and honest at the expense of possibly even losing a friend. But you're going to be honest in love. The reason for that is to hopefully be restored to them if they'll receive it. And if they don't receive it, go to the church. And if the church, if they don't listen to the church, let them go. He says basically treat them like they're lost. Go ahead and treat them like they're lost. Why? Because they're not ready to receive. Let them go out in the world and sow their oats and let the flesh rule until the flesh is destroyed and then maybe they can be saved. Don't Let's be honest about Let's be honest about sin in the life of the church. Knowing that somebody's living in sin and doing nothing about it, and they come every week, and they sit there, and we just act like it's no big deal. And then they tell somebody else what they're doing, or some other seat, and people are stumbling over it. No, no, we need to deal with that matter lovingly. And hopefully the person turns, and they come back to Christ. This is the heart of Christ. Ephesians 4.15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's how you build the church up in love, by being honest with one another, challenging one another to love. Loving somebody enough. And you say, well, what does that look like practically? When I know that this person has offended me, or I know that this person's in sin, and it's causing others to stumble, it, it, it looks like this. You go to them, and you sit with them privately, and you say, hey, I want to talk to you about something, and I want, you, I want to ask you a question first. Do you believe that I love you as a brother or sister in Christ? Do you believe I love you? And you want an honest answer from them. And they say, yeah, I do. I believe you love me. That I'm going to share this out of love. And then you share it. And you don't make statements. You ask questions. Is it true that you've been doing this, having an affair with someone that's not your wife? And wait for an answer. And see if they humble up. And it might be that they're going to they're gonna bow up. And if they bow up, it's not on you. If they leave the relationship with you, it's, it's not on you. You did it for the purpose of restoration. You want them to come right with God so that in your relationship, you're growing together. You're challenging them to grow. That's a Christian thing to do. Not to run around to somebody else and tell them, hey, he's having an affair. When we do that, church, we're acting like the world. 
Good grief. If you want that, just turn on the TV set because there's a reality TV show on every channel that has that kind of nonsense going on. But not as believers. We don't conduct ourselves that way. If there's a sin or an offense or even just an issue between you, love requires for you to speak lovingly to the person about it personally. If they won't listen to you, then go ahead and bring witnesses. If they don't listen to the witnesses, then bring it before the church. And if they won't listen to the church, you are to be treated, if that's you, that you wouldn't listen, you are to be treated as an outcast. Why? It's not for punishment, but for reconciliation. It's not punitive, it's for restoration. It's restorative. Amen? Tough message, isn't it? This Jesus of the Bible is a little different than the Jesus that the world knows today. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul gives the account of a man who, although he was living with his stepmother in immorality, he refused to take correction. They followed the process. The man wouldn't listen. Paul told the church at Corinth to turn him over to Satan that his flesh might be destroyed, but his spirit saved. In other words, let him live in the world uh, for a while until he gets so sick of the world that his flesh will be destroyed. Then, now he can come back to God. He can be saved. Now he can come back into the church and he can be a true believer, a child of God. Very important. That's exactly what happened. In, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11 and 12, we learned that that man did come to the end of himself and went back to the church. Restoration. That's the goal. Verse 18, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is not a general statement about anything you want to apply to it. He's being very specific here. He's saying, church, it's your job to bind sin. Sin is bound in heaven, therefore you, as the church, have authority to bind it on earth. Do it in love, but do it. Righteousness and holiness and mercy are in heaven, therefore loose those things in the church on earth. That's a direct right interpretation of that passage. Verse 19, again I say to you, if, you if, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. That's a message about prayer, but you connect it to what we just talked about. If you're in kingdom life, then you're going to walk in what? Humility, and you're going to what? Be honest. And as you're honest and in humility with brothers and sisters, then come together and pray. There's something beautiful about praying together. Because when you pray together, things happen. First of all, praying with others is motivating. It'll get you going. How many of you don't like to work out? But if you have a friend or two that you work out with, they're going to keep you motivated. They're going to call you, hey, where are you today? Get over here. We're working out. What are you talking about? Get over here. That's a good thing. When you pray with people, it keeps you motivated. Secondly, prayer with others is purifying. It's hard to make prayer about yourself when you're praying with other people. <laughs> okay, you, you open up. You want to, you, you now pray right prayers instead of wrong prayers like you might pray privately. And thirdly, uh, real important for all of us to see this, is that prayer with others is very confirming. When I'm praying with someone, if I'm praying right prayers, I'm hearing amens. That's true. That's true, Pastor. That's true. As you're praying, you're agreeing with you. But if you're praying with others and nobody's amen, and it could be that maybe you're praying a selfish prayer. You might want to go back and rethink what you're praying. So praying with others serves several benefits for us. Verse 20, for there where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. But remember now, keep those words that Jesus just gave in context of dealing with honestly with church matters relationships and kingdom life the church should pulsate with power when it comes to dealing with sin and releasing god's mercy with authority when the church functions that way where two or three are gathered in my name there am i in your midst i'm among you okay where the church is moving in the power of prayer and the authority of binding and loosing she will have an impact the church will be will manifest the glory of god Verse 21, then Peter came up and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And, and uh, he, he thought he was doing, uh, doing the right thing by saying uh, seven times. And where, where he got that was from the rabbis. The rabbis would say, you need to forgive seven times. So he's thinking he's, or actually they didn't say seven, they said, they said three times. 
So he thinks he's really going a lot further. I'm I'm more than doubling what the rabbi expects. Jesus is going to be impressed with this. Lord, seven times? And, uh, of course, you you know the answer, but before we get there, let me tell you, uh, this is the third aspect. There's, There's humility, there's honesty, and in kingdom living, there is forgiveness. Jesus has just broached the third subject. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Or 70 times seven in another passage. The point is, it's not the number. It's not 49 or 490. Listen, what he's talking about here is as often as it takes. Because who's going to keep track? How many of you would, would keep track? Okay, that was 76. <laughs> Nobody's doing that. That's not the point. The point is, you always forgive. And then Jesus closes this whole chapter out. This chapter closes. Jesus is giving a teaching on forgiveness. The point is, we're to just keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. Where there is binding and loosing, there must also be free, unending flow of forgiveness in the church. This whole teaching in Matthew 18 is not about discipline alone it's about restoration it's about caring about people loving people so he says in verse 23 therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants and when he began to settle one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents that's more than he could pay in a lifetime and since he could not pay his master ordered him to be sold and with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made so the servant fell on his knees imploring him have patience with me and i will pay you everything and out of the pity for him the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt he came to the master and he asked for forgiveness of the debt and the master gave it to him he just asked could you please forgive me what I owe you. I know it's more than I could ever pay in my lifetime, but could you forgive me of it? And the master said, yeah, I'll forgive you. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, a week's wages, two weeks wages, a month's wages. Let's just make it a year's wages. And And seizing him, he physically laid his hands on him. He began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant. Who's the wicked servant? The one who will not forgive a debt that can be repaid. I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me, and should, not, and should not you have also had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debts, which he couldn't pay. So also my heavenly Father, here's the point, Jesus gives the point, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. You'll never be content. You'll walk through life miserable because you did not forgive your brother who offended you. We all know people who are in torment and in prison because they won't forgive someone who wronged them. In this state of unforgiveness, they're no longer open and free. Instead, they're restricted. They're tormented. They're uptight. They're tense. They're angry. They're bitter. They're harsh. And they go through life that way. I'm not saying that every moment of every day they're like that, but it's always there, just ready to surface and show its ugly head. You see, the Lord tells us to forgive not for the sake of the offender, but for the sake of the one who has been offended. It's for your sake that you forgive. For your sake. Regarding confronting relationships, dealing with issues, binding and loosing, Jesus says, Remember that you're to be a people known for forgiving others over and over and over and over. That's kingdom life. Maybe you see yourself in the story. Maybe you've been hurt so badly that you just can't forgive. Maybe you're in prison. You've been robbed of joy and peace, and you just don't know how to get out of prison. The answer lies in the passage. 
the king, here it is, commanded that the servant remain in prison until he pay his debts. There's no way out of the pain and the sorrow and the bitterness and the anger and the tension that you feel unless you forgive. That's how God's wired it. <laughs> Just the way it is. The only way he could get out of prison was to go to his master and ask for forgiveness. And his master said, you're forgiven. And then if you have a brother who owes you, forgive them just as your father forgave you. And our father not only forgave us of the sin debt too great for us to pay, but he also justified us. Not only forgiving us, justifying us. Justification speaks of a legal term that's much more than just forgiveness. Justification means being declared righteous as though we never sinned at all. So here you have this sin debt you could never pay in your lifetime back to God. You're guilty. You're going to go to hell. Then God offers you redemption, forgiveness. And so you ask him, Lord, please, I receive Christ. Forgive me. And he wipes away your debt of sin. Then he justifies. He makes you righteous as if you have never sinned. Wrap your brain around that one. It's like the gentleman, an Englishman, who bought a Rolls Royce in England, and then he had it shipped across the channel, the English channel, to France because he wanted to do a one-month tour of France in his new Rolls Royce. And he got it over, shipped over, and he was cruising around the Rolls Royce. Somewhere in the journey of his tour, uh, the Rolls Royce broke down. So he got on the phone with the dealership back in London, and he said, hey, uh, my Rolls Royce broke down. I don't know what's going on, but it's not running. And the man on the other end of the line said, it will be taken care of immediately. And within a couple hours, several mechanics show up in France, and they're working on the Rolls Royce. And they get him right back up on the road. He's taken off, and he's going. And he finishes his tour, finishes the month, gets home to England, and he's thinking, man, I, I want to look at that bill, see what they're going to charge me for flying those guys over and all that stuff. And there's no bill from the dealership. He calls up the dealership, gets the same guy who sent the men over, and he said, hey, uh, you, I never got a bill from you. And the guy said, for what? What are you talking about? What's the bill for? Uh, well, you know what it's for. Uh, you sent men over to work on my Rolls Royce, and it was a mess, and they fixed it in the same day. How much is that going to cost me? And the guy on the other end said, sir, I have no record whatsoever of any repairs being done on a Rolls Royce, not now or ever at any time when it's brand new. That's you. God has no record of your wrong, ever. So if you're justified, where God sees you as righteous, and you're forgiven of a sin debt you could never pay, why would you hold on to unforgiveness of someone else? Do you see how prideful that is? How selfish that is? That your father forgave you and made you righteous, but you hold them accountable? Oh my goodness. Humility. Getting our eyes off of ourselves. Honesty. Dealing with our human problems in a biblical manner. Forgiveness. Forgiving and forgiving and forgiving until we can't count anymore. We just keep on going. Father, thank you so much for loving us this way. Something about that passage in Psalms that we are to give thanks because your steadfast love endures forever. And Lord, that just clears so much shame and guilt and past sin from people if they'll receive by grace through faith the message of the gospel, the work of Christ, the substitutionary work on the cross for their sins. And then, Lord, uh, just knowing that with such a heavy debt being lifted from us, we have the responsibility as brothers in Christ 
to not only be humble, but to be honest and to forgive others their debt to us. May this grow the family of God at Vero Bible Fellowship. May we just look a little different this next week and the weeks ahead as we practice what the Scripture teaches. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like to be prayed for today, we have uh, prayer partners and elders who will come forward and be glad to anoint you with oil and pray for you. And if you are here today and you have received Jesus Christ by grace through faith, you just have received this message of the gospel, uh, if you would, just let us know in the back. Uh, just give us your name, a phone number, or an email that we might be able to get in touch with you and follow up. We'd love to give you a, a Bible, a new Bible for free, no, no strings attached, and then also encourage you to uh, a path of discipleship where you can begin to grow in the Lord. So please allow us to do that for you. And uh, I want to thank you for being here today. I, I want to say this to you as well. You might have noticed coming in today that there was a patrol car at the entrance and we have an on-duty policeman with us, and they'll be with us in the future. And the reason for that is because of what we are seeing happening in the world today. Uh, times are changing, and more and more people are being uh, uh, taken advantage of in public settings. And so it's important to us to provide a level of protection, and uh, that's why we have that, just so you, that you know. And so we thank the Lord that we, we can have that kind of uh, law enforcement present. We do have a safety team. We also have law enforcement officers who are part of our church. But we're going to take whatever measure we can to provide a deterrent to anyone who might try to disrupt the work of God. And uh, people today, uh, um, I'll just tell you where I'm at. I'm not on the side of gun control. I'm on the side of mental illness and helping people get healthy so that if they have a gun, they know how to use it properly and, and not improperly. And so, but we have to protect ourselves, okay? That's why you see that. Thank you for being here today, and I pray that you are, have a blessed week. Walk in the Word this week, amen? God bless you.